And you're live, Golia. Hello. Yeah, okay, okay. So. This is something new. Mm, mm. And we can share our screen like this. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So, Gulnara just saw me eating chocolate, which was, you know, it was very tasty. She got it as a Christmas <laughs> present from her RBA work colleagues. So that, that's, and I've been eating it, which is showing on my face. The key thing is that we also watched the Willy Wonka movie and it's inspired Gulnara to chat a bit about it. So I'll pass over to you to introduce us. Right. Yeah. As hi everyone, as Matt has mentioned, uh, we watched the new uh, Willy Wonka movie, and one thing that took our attention was the chocolate cartel, and how much this related to many of the types of products um, we see in the world around us and the potential lack of competition which is involved in them, right? For the, for the context, uh, specifically in Willy Wonka movie, this cartel was shutting down innovation and providing an inferior product. So not just increasing the price in this way, uh, such competition issues feel like they're not only making things more expensive for us now, but they are also reducing growth and opportunities. So um, we have Matt here, and I would I wanted to hear your thoughts on this, Matt, and uh, how would you describe this as well? So mm -hmm. over to you. Okay, so I always have thoughts. Um, That's good. <laughs> yeah, if, if, we're, if we're talking about a cartel, yeah. so... We have a situation where there's a series of firms and they're colluding with each other in some way. So I'd want to think about how that collusion functions. So if, if we're going to talk about there's a cartel and they're preventing innovation and they're reducing the quality of the product and they're setting higher prices, well, the first thing we'll need to think about is effective competition. So we need to think about why there isn't a potential competitor that could come in that's forcing the cartel to, as a result, reduce its price. So if you only have one firm, but it's facing effective competition, it will act as a competitive firm. If there's only a few firms, same thing. But if those firms don't face that type of effective competition, then they can go and start doing some of these things. So how do we get in the way of effective competition? We need barriers to entry. So if, if we're going to chat about some sort of chocolate cartel, we would need to identify what the barriers to entry are and how they prevent effective competition. At, at the end, you also talked about the idea sort of innovation of like longer term costs associated with monopolies or cartels. Now, one of the reasons why we might not mind there being a cartel or a monopoly or why what appear to be barriers to entry in the short term aren't really, they're sort of necessary, is because investing in innovation as a type of investment. But the benefit of that innovation doesn't just go to the firm that innovates, it also goes to other firms by generating knowledge, creating knowledge. Yeah. So in order to get them to internalize that benefit and therefore invest enough in innovation, sometimes we need them to make a little bit more money in order to internalize the benefits, the spillover benefits to other people. So we might say that we allow cartels or we allow a monopoly because of these dynamic benefits. And these dynamic benefits are bigger than some short-term costs associated with imperfect competition. Now, the same things that look like R&D and they look like innovation, patents, they can be a signal of that or they can be a signal of a barrier to entry that's being created because instead of being used to make a new novel product, they're being used to stop someone from entering the market. So everything, if we discuss cartels, everything will be about on one side, are there these dynamic benefits because we think there's knowledge spillovers, but on the other side, are there barriers to entry? And, you know, is this investment creating those barriers? How do we understand those barriers? Only if we have the barriers do we really get a failure. Right. So... This now poses a follow-up question. So uh, in the scenario where we have barriers to uh, enter, why do you think there is a case where business can't enter when there is a dominant firm 
in the market. So can you describe a practical situation, for example, from the experience? Well, uh, you know, that's the thing. When we look at a specific circumstance, we'll want to identify the specific barrier. So when you look at, you know, the barrier to making a car, you have to have a lot of capital so you can invest in car manufacturing. There's economies of scale associated with doing so. There's learning by doing in the process of making cars that takes time to build up. And as a result, there's quite a substantive cost associated with entering the market. And that can allow them to in turn, you know, make monopoly rents. The, the more insidious one would be if there was a patent and that patent said, you can't use the word flower when you're naming a, you know, you like perfumes. There's a whole lot of perfumes just over there. <laughs> you can't use the word flower in a perfume because we have patented it. And then as a result, you're trying to like get involved in the market of perfumes that smell like flowers. You can never use the word flower. If you use the word at all just to describe what you're doing, they'll jump on you. That is a barrier to entry that's created in the market that would stop people entering even when they have the capability and resources to do so. So um, can you give an example of, um, so say these patents are created and they are lead to increasing a number of barriers, potential barriers for the other small and medium uh, businesses to enter. Uh, is there any institution or regulatory body that should be managing this type of number of patents that are blocking or creating potential barriers and um, yeah so and how it is it managed say how is it managed actually in Australia do you have or Australia and New Zealand like um, well it's similar across a lot of countries right you'll have a legal authority that's in charge of patents and the property rights they involve so your patent there is saying that you have created something and you're allowed to generate a return on it over time. An example of where that's important would be a lot of computer-based services where you've, gen you've generated some type of product by building up an infrastructure to do something, but that infrastructure is really easy for people to copy. And then they can go and they can compete you down and you don't make a return on doing so, so you never do it. So you get a patent on building that type of infrastructure and that give gives you a return in order you for you to stay in. So there'll be some type of legal authority that provides patents. But then on the other side, you'll have a competition authority that will judge, you know, when we look at some sort of definition of markets, is there excessive market concentration such that consumer surplus is being injured or hurt in some way? And, and different countries handle in different ways, but these are very legalistic concepts about property rights. And then ultimately, the, the, the amount of consumer surplus in a dynamic sense that is generated in those markets. So patents are admissible because they're a property right to a firm, and they're also admissible because they generate future consumer surplus. But if there's substantive harm because they're being used just to shut down competition and just to squeeze customers and generate a rent from customers, then competition authorities should push against them and, you know, dictate that those aren't admissible practices. And first force firms to split up, make patents not actually, you know, legally binding, all those sorts of things. Yeah, so I think I will come back to uh, patents and the um, regulatory bodies because it's extremely interesting and we would like to talk about from practical examples of specific luxury brands that um, resonates well with this type of restrictions and um okay chat about an example will you uh i so i wanted first also ask the questions that james zuccolo was asking ah uh, that's why so, you're quizzing me for, yeah. for the audience here the idea was that gulnara was going to talk about specific examples i didn't realize i get quizzed that's why I've been waffling incessantly. So. Right. So to the specific examples, we will come back. That's the fun part. So um, I'm going to ask the question that James was asking on don't cartels push up prices uh, by creating space for entrance if there aren't barriers. 
Um, so, so the the idea there is, you know, if a cartel increases the price then that price will induce entry. Because if you are sitting there making, you know, nice soaps, you could change what you're doing to make perfumes. And if you saw that perfumes became very, very expensive, you'd have quite an incentive to do so, even though it would involve changing the machinery you have on hand, it would involve having to work around patents and learn about the perfume industry. So there are these costs of entry, but if the price was high enough, it would lead to people entering. That touches on the idea that there's effective competition. So because a soap maker could substitute to be a perfume maker, that means that the perfume maker will face effective competition and will keep prices a bit lower as a result. A cartel is restricted by the, the effective competition they're facing. But this when they will come in and they will do things to increase barriers to entry. So if they can force patents that are really anti-competitive, if they could patent a word, if they could patent a certain type of flower, then they could turn around and, and look at this. So are perfumes patentable? They, they are, aren't they? In fact, this is where you have a really good story, Goya. Yeah. yeah, so I was going to give an example of a perfume brand, um, which I would, I would say rank as small to medium-sized brand, uh, issued a, um, a product called synthetic jungle and uh, Kenzo which is the quite a substantive uh, brand in the market uh, sued this company uh, for not letting them use jungle in any of their uh, products uh, perfume products because Kenzo patented jungle when they released their uh, popular bottle called elephant jung, elephant jungle yeah uh, so it was uh, ridiculous and this company has lost the case so uh, they had to remove all their bottles with synthetic jungle from the market and release a new bottle with the same the same content of the perfume um then i started to question uh so this definitely creates an obstacle for uh, small and uh, medium brands. And how can we actually, uh, sounds like a trademark. Um, yeah. It's true. It's that's true. true. Economists are incredibly lazy with their language. So that's what a little yeah, bad. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and, and then, um, so I was going to uh, talk about also a couple of luxury brands, say uh, uh, LVMH, which makes all Louis Vuitton and all that um, Dior and all everything under the same uh, brand. And apparently, for instance, Tiffany is also uh, included under, under LV, uh, LVMH. And recently I was reading that they have patented the color, the Tiffany blue color. So apparently, if you want to uh, create anything and use that color as your labeling, uh, you you can be sued again uh, against this, and uh, will yeah more likely <laughs> lose the case, and will have to remove all this color from which which is quite ridiculous. And I think um, some um, competition authorities should be in charge, or some sort of authority uh, need to look over this type of ridiculous degrees of how much you can go far. So the, these these specific, you know, requirements and their enforcement, these are all European brands, right, that you, yeah. you're talking about. Um, and Europe is well known for having very strict competition law and like forcing, so they've just forced Apple to switch to USB-C for their phones and for the and like a whole lot of homogenization of charges for devices. And they've also, you know, they, they're the ones that pressured Microsoft to split up. They, they put all the additional rules on Google for operating. So a lot of uh, a lot of different tech firms. And when economists estimate these types of rents and the, the action of innovation, it's really only Apple that appears to be extracting consumer surplus. And they're doing a lot of that through brand in the first place. 
a lot of these other tech companies don't actually appear to be anti-competitive, but Europe will still split them up because they use very, very strict definitions and very strict rules about concentration. Now, you're saying that in Europe, when we look at these European companies, they don't impose nearly the same types of rules that they're imposing to the US companies. Um, so, I mean, if I was to, to look at that, I'd say that the European Competition Authority look like hypocrites. It's not that they don't recognize the issue and that they don't recognize that innovation could be, uh, intervention could be beneficial. They're just not willing to do it if it's a European company. So who is best placed to uh, enforce these organizations themselves? Oh, I would say the competition authority and the headquarter jurisdiction would be the most appropriate because they, they will actually, you know, be able to definitively force the entire organization to change what it's doing. Of, of course, at the same time, if you're, if you're the largest market for a company, then any rules you set for trading in your jurisdiction will have a big impact on what you do. Um, but when we look at things like Louis Vuitton, Europe is both a large market and it's the headquarter jurisdiction for those things. So why aren't they intervening like with ridiculous patents about the having jungle in a name and having the color of a perfume be a certain color? Why, why, why are those admissible when, you know, having bundled Microsoft products was not admissible? Yeah. So I'm guessing, do you think there is a role of multilateral organizations here where they could act a bit of uh, authority bodies where they could make a cross-country assessment a little bit? Well, the difficult thing here, right, is when you have a multinational organization trying to determine things about uh, what corporations can or can't do, they aren't just determining a minimum set of rights for those corporations. They're also impinging on the domestic law of the jurisdictions that are operating. So when we come to taxes, for example, there was a big lot of drama about instituting a minimum corporate tax rate of 15% across all countries, because some countries like Hungary and Estonia did not want, and Saudi Arabia, did not want a corporate tax at all. Right. Other countries like Australia and New Zealand have quite high corporate tax rates, but have a domestic imputation system. And so if these multi, uh, multilateral agreements and these multinational enterprises were treated a certain way, it would create a disjoint between how they're treated and how domestic only companies are being treated. So this creates a lot of drama. And there's a question about whether, you know, something like the OECD or the UN can really force countries to change their rules. Now, if you start going into the miniature of competition law, I think there would be a lot of concern about that. Um, so I, I don't think we could really have outside of certain minimum conditions. And, you know, like the question is, why would we need a UN or an OECD to do it when the very act of if you're in New Zealand and you're trading, you know, you will want to impose certain minimum standards about what you export because you're also protecting your own reputation. Uh, and then countries that are purchasing will say they want certain minimum things as well. To my mind, when we're looking at things like Louis Vuitton, the big issue is actually coming from their trademarks being implemented in Europe. And that's a European Commerce Commission related uh, issue. Um, so if they're not doing it, that's just on them. Right. Now, I would like also to hear a bit of your thoughts uh, about mergers and acquisitions. A specific example I can um, bring up, let's say Disney and Disney Plus, right? So Disney went and bought a um, whole lot of uh, companies and merged the uh, Star Wars and uh, Marvels and, and etc. pretty much squeezed out uh, any potential competitors in the market. So now what we end up having is what Disney and the, that huge cartel dictates in terms of the plot settings and uh, um, it dictates the film filming industry. And it's really becomes impossible to compete with such a giant organization like that. So do you think 
So th there are pros and cons associated with it. And in, in the beginning, you have mentioned that um, because they have like huge capital, they can foster innovation, they can get, they can have a lot of investment in, in future uh, stuff uh, that small businesses cannot afford necessarily. But it also leads to some sort of um, a lack of innovation if they have um, a specific dogmatic view about the business and how it, it, it should be made. And we as a, a consumers on this end have to just put up with what we are fed with. So what is your what are your thoughts around that? Just Mr. before we jump to that, Graham's also pointing out that the UN doesn't have the power to impose rules. Uh, except for security council matters, but not for trade. That's that's right. Yeah. 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 So you probably meet someone like uh, World Bank or IMF or the, OECD. The, they all face those sorts of limitations, right? So even the the OECD, uh, you know, pillar one and pillar two, that that has to pass through domestic law. Yeah, yeah. But still, on, on the point of um, on the point of mergers. So we're, if we're focusing on Disney here. Let, let, let's we're always going to think about barriers to entry and effective competition okay we're always coming back to that disney can go around and can pull together as many ips as it wants and those ips might have some sort of underlying reputational capital associated with them uh, but they would have paid a price for that etc 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 when we look at disney and when we look at the movie industry before Disney did all of that, there was pretty limited competition in some sense anyway. So there were these few big companies that worked with each other a lot. And that's just the, the nature of things. I'm not convinced that the competition issues are worse, even after all those mergers. Because when we look at the creation of the product, well, what are you doing right now? You're on, you're on a video, right? People with relatively limited means can produce you know nice looking products people can group together to create movies at a lower cost a lot of the difficulties is a lot of the difficulties are actually about getting the movies out there and going through networks of getting them in cinemas etc cetera, etc cetera. but c cinemas are doing much worse now a lot of what you're relying on instead is some type of platform so Disney Plus is a type of platform, but they're facing huge amounts of competition from other platforms as well. And one of those platforms, in a sense, would be YouTube. So if Disney acts very anti-competitive and it produces bad movies over and over and over again, increasingly there'll be scope for people to produce other content and for people to move across to that and to monetize that in different ways. And the whole you know, media infrastructure will sort of just break up a bunch. So I'm not I'm not fully convinced that when we look at Disney, we've got the same sort of competition issue that we do with some of these other cases. Um, I see what you're saying. However, Marvel was a, a separate entity, and it was it still is. Yes, but it was producing its own separate thing, and was good at uh, up until. Uh, when so uh, what I'm what I'm getting at is um, a lot of Disney stuff sucks now. Yeah, so point? so say there will be an alternative platform where um, some group of people will start producing something that we like that Disney doesn't provide us, but as soon as Disney Disney will go and purchase them as well because they want to eliminate any competitor. And then we will again end up being in that bad equilibrium where, again, we have to watch and follow what Disney it, It's about barriers to entry, Gulia. So yeah. if the barriers to entry are sufficiently low and they keep purchasing competitors, new competitors will keep showing up until they, they'll just lose market share. At some point, they won't be able to do that anymore. They'll just collapse on themselves, right? They would need to impose barriers, and we need to identify what the barriers are to make sense of what's happening. So the barriers to entry are, you know, that it's very difficult to put movies out to different places. Organizing a huge cast of people and, and actors is very difficult. And, you know, who knows? What, now that we've got AI-related things that do vocals, that do acting, now that so many actors are just, to be honest, complete crap. I mean, 
I I'm, guess I'm getting old, but actors nowadays aren't particularly talented, right? Increasingly, you just want to watch animated movies instead because they've got more character and they seem more human. I think there are talented actors. It's it could be just they um, they uh, they are not at utilized well. Yeah, or probably the uh, the ones that Disney is picking is through their specific network, and those good actors are, don't have that opportunity to actually. Uh, be in the movies that we want to see nowadays in the look, cinema. If Disney's spending its own capital doing things that aren't actually what people want, over time they'll just fall apart. And that, that's happened in the movie industry a whole bunch. The, the difference is there's just much lower barriers to entry for a lot of media-related products now. And that's what's happened to the newspapers as well. Newspapers were a money-printing machine Right? And they could invest in quality, they could invest in certain types of things. Now that they're no longer a money printing machine and they're highly competed against, they're riddled with spelling errors, logical inconsistencies. They had people that just had huge gaps in what they can know, which is understandable because their focus is being journalists, but no time to reach out and try to build knowledge through that and create an article. So they end up putting out in consequential trite that's filled with spelling errors and it's not their fault it's because the industry is now facing such a lot of competition yeah. on um on the mergers uh, uh i just wanted i i don't know uh so my, my knowledge probably is not that big in mergers and acquisitions uh i wanted to hear a bit of your um view if you if you know in any country uh there is any restriction uh, for example um to grow or to merge beyond specific size or to merge uh beyond specific number of entities that you can uh, buy well, is there any look, country? look at look at uh, australia and new zealand examples with supermarkets right so there was a merging of supermarkets in the early 2000s in New Zealand that wouldn't pass current competition law because of concerns about scale. Um, there was recently questions at the more local level in Australia uh, whether certain supermarket locations could be bought by a competitor and a decision that local market concentration that would cause would be too high. So the idea of merger, mergers and acquisitions both at the company level and at the enterprise level, where you've got a, a single sort of area where the product's being made. So if you think about a supermarket, all the different supermarket branches, uh, those are very active. And again, they're competition authority issues. And, and they look at that in terms of, you know, will this lead to a substantial reduction in competition? And we care about the substantial reduction in competition because of the effect on lifetime consumer surplus for consumers. So those will be the underlying sets of rules they'll be applying. So that's a very interesting case because Australia and New Zealand are the countries uh, who has uh, specifically competition issues with the supermarkets because so, we have oligopolies um, we, uh, with the supermarket business, uh, which is partially a product of the high prices of individual products. So partially it is because we are far away from the global supply chains, but part of it is also the oligopolies uh, where supermarkets can uh, supercharge for the prices. What is your view about that? So what, what is the barrier to entry always has to be the question, right? Yeah, what is if it? you're just saying that we're distant from market, then you're saying that it requires a higher rate of return in order for a supermarket to exist. So why don't we have entry of supermarkets in Australia and New Zealand? Why, when the warehouse in New Zealand tried to set up a supermarket, they end up not working, and apart from a couple of flagship stores, they pulled back from setting up supermarkets? Why is it not profitable for certain supermarket retailers to come in? It's because of many reasons. One that's been identified in New Zealand is that land prices are very high. So the actual cost of setting up is very high. And in order to pay back the opportunity cost associated with buying all that land, you have to actually make a fairly high return. So the high margins we see for supermarket retailers in Australia and New Zealand are associated with high land prices, difficulty of organizing supply chains compared to larger markets, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but even with that, you know, there is a feeling that surely prices seem too high when we go to the US, you know, yeah. it just feels so much Europe. cheaper. Right. Yeah, but even with Europe and the US, they're becoming more expensive while Australia and New Zealand's have just stayed expensive. And there is a real question about why can't we get a competitor, right? Now, now, there might be other regulations in place. It could be that New Zealand and Australia apply higher food safety standards, which then get baked into the price of things. And the New Zealand context is the one I know better. And in the New Zealand context, there's a view that supermarket power leads them to underpay providers, you know, the people giving the fresh food and produce, and to overcharge consumers. Uh, and now if that's the case, you would expect there's some incentive to enter. So what's stopping people from entering there? We've noted the idea of land prices, but probably even more pertinent is zoning. I remember when I was living in Wellington and I was in Northland and they, they were trying to build a supermarket there forever. And they just kept being shut down by the locals. We would receive flyers in the mail, people saying we can't have the supermarkets nearby us even though it won't affect us nothing will drive past us you know it doesn't affect anything we just don't like the idea of there being a development and this empty dump lot where there was a whole lot of trash and it's not even like it was a nice piece of bush or something so you know if, if new zealand's going to act like that you know in that sort of nimby-esque sense you end up paying for it through more expensive houses more expensive supermarket prices so an interesting perspective however there are lots of other businesses in new zealand or in australia say shoe business or uh, ski business and they do face same restrictions of the landing and the zoning and etc do you think there is something beyond just those two reasons so you've mentioned about the um food quality regulation and etc could that be uh, that specific aspect that is a key contributor to to this barrier? I mean, I would just want to think, can we identify what the barriers are? Rather than just saying people are greedy, because, well, no shit. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they, are, they are everywhere. I don't think the U.S. is less greedy. But, you know, U.S. food quality is atrocious. So when we look at New Zealand, I mean, are there other barriers or is it just small scale? If we were to increase the population to 20 million people, would food be cheaper? Probably. Um, well, if you would increase population by that, you would just end up being Australia. But Australia still have higher food prices than uh, the US. So, yeah, but lower than New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Australia has its own issues, right? News, like Australia has all sorts of strange policies about, you know, regulating what people can do regarding stores, zoning laws and overdrive, tax subsidies for staying small, uh, labor laws that reward small firms and punish firms that try to hire additional workers. All sorts of stuff that leads to just really weird outcomes. Australia is an incredibly heavily regulated place. The other thing to remember as well is that New Zealand and Australia have very high minimum wages. And the wage of a lot of supermarket workers is tied to the minimum wage or some sort of Fair Work Act agreement around the wage in Australia. And when that's the case, some of that will get passed on as prices as well. And because we want to, you know, uh, allow people opportunities to earn what we view as a, a fair income and we want the income distribution to narrow, that's fine. And that can be a choice and that, that can turn up in higher goods prices. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the original literature on minimum wages did find that there was a pass through in prices. And they said that can be a conscious choice because it still leads to better outcomes for those employees. It doesn't appear to have a large employment effect, although the New Zealand minimum wage is at such a high level relative to other countries, we would need New Zealand specific evidence. So then it becomes a value statement about, you know, what's a fair distribution of income, et cetera, et cetera. In that context, you know, 
paying a bit more for groceries might be completely acceptable, but would want to think what's driving it. The idea that supermarkets can just magically make lower margins and will provide the same level of quality and accessibility, I don't know, it feels like a pipe dream. Yeah. Yeah. But if someone could identify a very clear barrier to entry, one that's imposed by the supermarkets that prevents entrance coming in, that prevents overseas supermarket tra uh, trade setting up here, such as setting up contracts with suppliers that do not allow suppliers to sell to other supermarkets. I believe there is a degree of that in New Zealand as well. And that's somewhere where they could try to open up rules to say, actually, as a farm, you can go and you can sell to different supermarkets. So you've just mentioned that from your observations, the prices in Europe and, and US has been growing while here it's high, but it, it was um, sort of staying relatively steady. Um, what are the key reasons for the price growth in um, the US and in Europe? Um, what is? It's a good question. I mean, I've got no idea. I'll, I'll have to pretend to know things. In terms of the United States, we, we do know there's been substantial increases in the minimum rate wage around other places. And then we also know that there's been pretty substantial inflation. There's also been just very strong real income growth. I, I can't believe, I could never believe how wealthy the US was and it's be, continued to become wealthier and wealthier. When you look at somewhere like Europe, instead there's been massive stagnation. Somewhere like Italy is... Is it about 20% poorer than it was before the global financial crisis per person in terms of income? I mean, that's just absolutely insane. The, the UK and Italy are the two extreme examples of how things can go bad and Greece, but all around Europe, it's like that. Now, it's not useful to just think about prices in isolation. And that's where I think this can quickly go off tack. Instead, we should be asking about real incomes. You know, when we see supermarket prices go up, when we see house prices going up, if it turns out nominal incomes are going up as well and people can still buy those bundles of goods, if not more, then that's what's what's appropriate. Countries like the United States and to a lesser extent Australia and New Zealand have seen real income growth, relatively strong real income growth, while countries in Europe have not. So even if their supermarket prices seem cheap to an outsider, for someone actually living there, they could be very expensive. When we see how high supermarket prices are in Australia, Australia is a ridiculously high income country. So that's part of the story of it. So it is how it is. It is still a puzzle where um, in, in those European countries that you've mentioned, the real in income growth wasn't that high and yet the prices um, for food uh, are growing. and um, Well, um, part of what you have to remember recently with Europe is the war. Yeah. You know, it has interrupted supply chains in Europe. It has made it more expensive when Ukraine and southern Russia are the breadbasket of Europe. Um, so they end up having to get food from places that are further away. The... The hard thing with Europe, though, is, you know, it's just like the Great Depression in the US. So when you look at the Great Depression in the late 1920s and early 1930s, you had the droughts. And, and the, the Dust Bowl was sort of used as a reason why the Depression happened and why everything was so difficult there. But a lot of the reason why there was a depression in the US is the financial system collapsed and then there was just incredible monetary policy tightness and which led to a spiral of deflation. And that supply shock was just a small part of it. It's very easy to look at something like the war in Russia and Ukraine and say that since uh, Russia went crazy and then because they went crazy, they also cut off oil from Europe and that led and natural gas and that led to a supply shock and you can use that to sort of bemoan what's happening there but in essence ben mole showed that that's only a small part of what could have caused a slowdown in those countries the real driver has been you know refusing to 
deal with demand shocks by stimulating monetary policy um, and, and ultimately just policy uncertainty associated with what, what is happening and, and what they're going to do. If it was just a supply shock, then countries like Greece, which have turned around and supplied boats to the Russians to help them sell their products in other places, should have done really well. Um, but that that isn't the driver of everything that's happened. So, yeah. No. That's a, a good reasoning. Um, but what, what does this have to do with chocolate? I thought we were talking about chocolate. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, <laughs> to come back to the original... Yeah. Did you want to reflect on anything that we, we've we just discussed in, in regards to the cartels? What is well, your... I think we should just say, we should say the details of what the cartel was in the Willy Wonka movie without spoiling the movie at all. Right. So the Willy Wonka movie is a prequel to the Will, the later, the earlier Willy Wonka movies. Right. So he's a little kid. He's, what is it? Timothy, what's his name? Uh, Charlemagne. Charlemagne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he did a pretty good job. He was an excited kid. He wanted to sell chocolate, right? And he made tasty, interesting, innovative chocolate. And there was a cartel, and they were determined to not let people enter in terms of setting up a chocolate shop. Um, and they were hiding the fact they were a cartel, so it was tacit collusion. And then there was also a big impetus about how, as a cartel, they sold the chocolate in an expensive way. They also sold low quality chocolate and they pushed the idea that chocolate should be plain and they kept it very plain. So there was definitely scope for him to enter as a chocolate maker who made innovative, different chocolate. But they were using different types of barriers to entry, such as their knowledge of governments and bribery of the police force in order to ensure that they wouldn't face competition and that they could make the product as cheaply as they could and make as much money as they could from that. So it was fun because it touched on so many dimensions of how a cartel can work and how once you've got a cartel that works alongside the state and motivates itself as part of the state, as part of society, that can be even worse for consumers. And we see that happen in the modern day. We see large companies in New Zealand, so important for New Zealand, part of the New Zealand brand. We need to be protected. We need to be insured, yada, yada. Any big company, you'll see it in great time. The person that ends up getting hurt is who's invisible, which is often the consumer, right? And then this movie did a good, a good job of actually showing that, although the person they were showing getting hurt was the entrepreneur. Um, which I suppose is true as well. No, that's that's a good wrap up, and <laughs> you didn't spoil it. <laughs> um, yeah, so it resonated with us a lot, and we just immediately they were practical life examples which we could bring up where this type of um, miscoordination happens, um, or between those authorities because uh, some of them are probably bribed so that they they pretend not to see the issues yeah. of um, the lack of the competition. Um, I think the dangerous thing is we sit there and we watch a movie like that and we see bribery, like explicit bribery, and we say, aha, all we need is people not to be bribed. You know, in China, that's how they talk. They, they say, if we deal with bribery in our system and corruption, then everything will be better. You know, this is not the Confucian way, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they, they often announce that they're going to deal with bribery over and over and over again. But it doesn't need to be bribery. It can be being persuaded that the way to support society is by supporting this big corporate. If we allow these people to act this way, they can organize things in a way that's better for everyone. Oh, we'll, and we'll just look past that because we're convinced that makes sense. Part of the reason why the economic, economic frameworks and economic language is so useful is it allows us to cut away from that and say, look, there, there can be reasons why the big corporate should be supported. There can be spillovers and innovation, yada, yada.